Well, good morning, friends. My name is Morris Gleiser, and uh, it is an incredible joy and great privilege to be with you on this particular Sunday as uh, your pastor has graciously allowed me the opportunity and the privilege to open up the Word of God with you today and for the next uh, three days afterwards and to have the opportunity to take the Word of God and to present it in, in truth as it is written and application to our life. I trust that by this time you've already enjoyed the singing uh, with your church. I know that it's different. What unique days we are living in while you are there at your home or wherever it is you may be watching this particular uh, online service. Uh, I'm grateful for your pastor. Pastor Bickle has been very gracious to me, very kind to me to allow me the opportunity to be with you not only today, uh, but, but for the next three evenings, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, they'll explain to you, he will explain to you exactly uh, uh, the time frame as to when the services will be shown uh, on your church's website or whatever uh, platform you may be using to uh, view the church services. I am just thankful for the opportunity. I sure wish I could be there with you. I know I met some of you three years ago when my wife and I were greatly privileged to be at the Bethel Baptist Fellowship Church. And I, 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 we were so looking forward to being back. But as every pastor has been saying, he longs to be back with his people once again. Well, I long to be back on the road in ministry and travel once again. But I'm telling you, this is a tremendous privilege for me to be able to be with you, to open up the Word of God and to be able to uh, explain it to us and to help us to take another step in our Christian development. And I pray that you'll let that happen for you. Now, I want to get right into today's scriptures, but let me just challenge you beforehand with two or three things very quickly. Can I do that? Uh, first of all, uh, I hope that you have a Bible in hand. I mean that. I don't, don't sit there like this is uh, some kind of a performance or some kind of a service in which you just sort of sit back and listen. Some of you who are normally note takers, take notes. Uh, you're going to hear some things, hopefully, from the scriptures today that will be important to be written down. So take notes if you desire to do so. Stay engaged. Stay engaged with these sermons and these messages. Let them speak to your heart. Open up the Bible. I know that you have small children and you have other obligations there that are pulling for you. Well, do what you can in every service uh, to get uh, the children under control and get the, uh, get the family in order so that you can truly uh, turn everything else off, get away from your phone, and get away from other things, uh, unless you're watching on your phone, of course, and, and just simply listen to the, to the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Now, that's nothing new. It's something that you would practice if you were at church. I'm just asking you to do it while you're sitting there in the privacy of your home. And then plan to be uh, online with us every night, would you? Uh, this week, we just plan to uh, uh, schedule time. I'm going to do my best, honestly, to stay in the neighborhood of about 30 minutes. Now, don't, don't tar and feather me if I happen to go over that a little bit. I've been known to struggle with that. But I'm going to do my best to keep my portion of these services within a 30 to 35 minute time frame. And so I'll be watching the clock. I know that you will as well. And so I pray that you'll just, just put some time together to listen to the Word of God uh, this week. I want it to be a help and an encouragement to you. Ask the Lord to speak to you. Can, can you do that? Can you just take some time uh, and say, no, Lord, I don't want to just listen to words. I want to hear from the Word, the Word of God. So let the Lord speak to your heart during these days together, would you? Right now, this morning, I want you to go to the book of Philippians. What a great letter. The letter to the church at Philippi that the Apostle Paul, under guidance of the Spirit of the Lord, wrote uh, to his friends there in Philippi. Paul was in a prison, uh, and yet as you read his letter, you can't really tell he's in a prison. He's in such a good mood. He is rejoicing in God's goodness. I hope that you still are practicing that even though you feel like you're going stir crazy in your home. It's not a prison, nothing like what Paul was going through. You say, Morris, you don't, you don't know my children. No, no, I don't. But my point to you is that you're not in a prison. But 
Paul was rejoicing. And Paul gives us something in chapter 3. Could you get chapter 3 opened up in front of you? I'm giving you time to find it and locate it. And I want to read to you some verses. What, what Paul is giving to us here in Philippians 3 is his testimony. Do you have a testimony? Well, you do. But my prayer is that your testimony is similar to some degree to that which the Apostle Paul, this man Paul, was speaking of. Every testimony that anybody has has three parts. And we're going to look at his testimony. It's the time before Christ, B.C., before Christ. Then the second part of your testimony is when you were converted, converted to Christ. And then the third and the last part, which I hope that you're in right now, is the progressive development, the spiritual growth that takes place in your testimony. Can we take a look at it? I want you to see it. Beginning in verse, verse 4, look at what the Apostle Paul says here, Philippians 3. It says this, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. I'm going to stop right there, but I want you to stay, keep your Bible open to Philippians 3. You know, I was privileged to work with teenagers for, uh, boy, uh, I really, I feel like I still work with teenagers because I'm honored and privileged to speak to them frequently at youth rallies and at uh, teen camps across the country, and I'm grateful for all those opportunities. Well, I, I was a youth pastor, student ministries pastor, for a total of about 20 years, and uh, I, I've met a lot of kids that have been a tremendous, incredible blessing to me and to my wife, Lynn. Well, I can tell you also of testimonies of young people whose lives were radically, uh, dramatically, incredibly changed through the work of God in their life. And I, I, I can think of all kinds of illustrations to tell you. I think about one young lady, don't have time to tell you all the details, but she was a bitter girl, angry girl, and she was angry with her parents. And she would tell you that was the case. I met her. I was early on as a youth pastor in this particular church, and uh, I could tell something was really bothering her, and uh, I kept asking her why it was that she uh, was struggling to listen to the Word of God. Why is it that she wasn't really uh, interested in spiritual matters? And though she beat around the bush and she would make faces and, oh, she would, she would express herself as, of someone who was just kind of put out with it all. She honestly was uh, enjoying the attention uh, that uh, we were giving her. After a while, I asked her, I said, who are you mad at? And uh, who are you bitter with? And that's when she exploded and told me that she was angry with her parents, in particular, uh, her mom. Her mom and dad had moved from one state and had moved to another state in the United States in order to protect their daughter from having a bad association, a bad relationship with what she called was a boyfriend. And oh, this teenage girl was just fit to be tied. She was angry, didn't like what was taking place. And through the preaching of the word of God over, can I tell you honestly, about an entire year of the hearing of the word of God, because she always had to be there, uh, she was full of rage and anger. Uh, bitterness is the better word to express. Uh, after about a year, one particular night, I had the great joy of leading her to Jesus Christ. You say, what does that mean? Well, she recognized that she was outside of a relationship with God. And she said, I need to be saved. I need to be spiritually rescued. And she was on one particular night. It was great. It was glorious. Can I just tell you, as angry and as bitter as she had been, she dramatically changed to become a young lady of phenomenal joy. And I mean that. You know who her best friend was after that? 
her mom. I would watch her walk into church on the arm of her mom. She'd have her arm in, intertwined with her mom, and they'd sit together in church. This girl, this teenage girl, smiled continually, constantly. Uh, she was a joy to all of our hearts. It was a delight. I'm going to tell you something else. Uh, she graduated from high school, very smart girl, went off to Bible college and got an education. And after a span of time, she called me one day. I was already out in revival work, evangelism. She called and she said, uh, Brother, she, they called me Pastor G. My last name is Gleiser. Pastor G, she said, would you perform my wedding ceremony? And I looked at the calendar and I said, you know something? I got room. I can do it. And so she made arrangements and I made arrangements and we went there to be a part of her wedding. Can I tell you in all sincerity, I have, I have laughed as I've thought back and remembered how that girl stood there at that marriage altar and she just, she just kind of wiggled the whole time, kept looking at her husband-to-be and uh, was just having the time of her life, just glowing with the privilege of getting married. In fact, I even had said at one time, whispering, because I could see the people in the crowd, they began to laugh watching her uh, dancing around and giggling around up there. I had to whisper and say, be still, because she was laughing. She was moving around so much. Now, I'm going to just tell you something. She was changed. God did that. Jesus Christ changed her. That was her testimony. And that change is continuing. How about you? Do you have a testimony of change? Has Jesus Christ changed you? And is he continuing to change you? Very quickly, would you notice the days B.C., before Christ, in Paul's testimony? Go back to our passage. Look, look please, if you would, notice where, where Paul said that uh, he started off with the right beginning. Look at verse 4 again. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more, look at this, verse five, circumcised the eighth day. He had the right beginning. You say, what do you mean? He came from a very orthodox Jewish family. And I'm gonna tell you something. They adhered to the Old Testament teaching of the law of circumcising your male baby boy on the eighth day. And Paul said, I started off right. I had the right beginning. Not only that, he said, I had the right nationality. Keep reading. He said there, of the stock of Israel. He goes, I'm full-blown, total from head to toe, an Israelite. He said, man, he said, I am of the stock of Israel. He was of the right beginning and the right nationality. And then he said, I came from the right tribe. Look at our text again, verse 5. He said, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, what's the point? Well, Benjamin and Judah were the two tribes that stayed when the kingdom was divided. Don't have time to go back and revisit it, but when the kingdom was divided in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the southern kingdom, known as Judah, was comprised of those from the tribe of Judah and those from the tribe of Benjamin. And they were more connected with King David. And so what was Paul saying? He says, man, I'm telling you something. If anybody had anything to brag about, I did. I had the right beginning. I had the right nation, nationality. I had the, the right tribe. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And not only that, he said, I had the right rearing. Keep reading. He says there, he says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He said, man, he said, I had, I had the right training. He says, I was taught the Old Testament. I knew the Bible. I knew God's truth. I had the right beginning. And he said, not only the right beginning and the right nationality and the right tribe and the right training. He said, I had the right energy. Keep reading. He said here, he said in verse six, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He said, man, he says, I was all in as one who was gonna persecute this church crowd. He said, I had the right energy. And then he said, and I had the right morality. He goes on to say there in verse six, uh, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You know what he was saying? He was saying, I had my ducks in a row. I had my I's dotted and my T's crossed. And he said, everything I had going for me was on, was on the first plane level. I was top drawer with my religion. 
but something, more importantly, someone was missing from my life. Paul said, before Christ, he said, I looked good. He said, I had everything put together as it needed to be. I had everything except Jesus. I was sincere, but I was sincerely wrong. A man stepped forward in a church service not just too long ago, just a few weeks ago before we all had to go home and uh, stay at home. A man came forward. I mean, a grown adult man came forward. He was on vacation visiting the church where I was privileged to preach. He stepped forward during the invitation time and he told the pastor, I have been like that man, Paul. I had, I've been trusting all the good stuff of my life for all of my life. He said, I came from a good family, a religious home, a church attending home. But he said, I'm not saved. I am not right with God in that I have never come to Jesus Christ. I've been trusting all that good stuff in my life. I talked to the man after the service, after his, after his time alone, and with tears in his eyes, he said, I sat there this morning and I realized I have been literally depending upon all of the good stuff in my life to get me to God. He said, today I realized that wasn't going to take care of me spiritually and eternally. This is Paul's testimony before Christ. Then the second part, the conversion to Christ. Well, what, what, uh, what happened here? What does he tell us here? Look at verse seven in our passage. I've not read this yet. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss, for Christ. It was like he was looking at his spiritual ledger and he was saying, I look at everything that I've accomplished and everything I've done. And then I looked at God and I saw his perfection. And he says, I came up extremely short, way short. I'm so far away from God. Look at verse eight. He said, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. What was he saying? He was saying, friend, now listen, he said, there came a day when I looked at my life and I realized there was a void. There was an emptiness. There was something drastically missing from my life. And what it was, was Jesus Christ. He said, I looked at everything that I thought I was accomplishing in my life, and I saw a huge void until I came to Jesus Christ. Look, I don't know where you may be in the realm of your spiritual activities or in the thinking of your life, but I'm going to tell you something, friends. Until you recognize that you cannot get you to Jesus Christ, you can't get you to God, you're going to be in trouble. You need to recognize this morning, honestly, that the thing that is missing in your life is not another church association, not, a, not another good deed. There's a lot of good, good things going on in our country today, people helping others who are hungry and those who are uh, strapped uh, and not able to get out, those who are sick. I mean, I mean, our hands are applauding and our hat goes off and our heart goes out to the good activities of people, and that's wonderful. But my heart breaks for those people who think that by doing those good things, they're going to get to God and go to heaven someday. Friends, that will not get you there. You've got to recognize there is nothing you can do to get you to God. You're separated from him, and it's your sin. There's only one thing that could be done. Somebody's got to pay for the price of all my sin and all your sin. Someone's got to, somebody's got to step in between God and and mankind and take care and pay what you could not pay yourself. Hey, I know someone who did it. The only one who could do it. And that's Jesus. He's not a historical figure. He's not just someone for us to think on on Easter Sunday a couple of weeks ago. No, friends, he is the savior of our eternal soul. Your soul, your life is going to exist somewhere forever. It's either heaven or hell. You need to come to Jesus Christ today and say, dear God, 
I realize I'm a sinner separated from you for all eternity. And I ask Jesus to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I know I'm a sinner separated from God because of God's holy, divine character and nature. God is holy. And God, I can't get myself to you. I need a rescuer. Yes, you do. And that rescuer is saying to you today, come to me and I will give you eternal life. That's what he said over and over again. He said, I have died. I have, I have paid for you. I have paid for your sin. It is finished, he said on the cross. What was finished? The payment for all of your sin. So why don't you accept him today? You may just simply say something like this. You can do it right now. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I'm separated from God. I want to know eternal life. I want to know you. And I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven when my last breath on earth is taken. Jesus, forgive me of my sin and come into my life right now. Would you do that? There's one more element of this testimony I want everybody to see and to hear. You may say, Morris, I've accepted Christ and Christ has, has called me unto himself and I, I heard that call and I came to Jesus Christ. Okay, okay. Is that the end? No, friend. Your testimony needs to continue. And Paul, in his writing here to the church at Philippi, tells us of the continuance of his testimony. He says there in verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Let me stop right there and simply say this. What Paul is saying to all of us is that there came a time when he recognized he needed the Savior, but it didn't stop there. After conversion, progress continued. Is that happening for you, sir? Ma'am, teenager, is this continuing in your life? Look, look, when you, when you are outside of Jesus Christ, there is a positional change when you come to Christ. In the spiritual realm, there is a positional change that takes place. You step into a relationship with God. It's called salvation. There's going to come a day when we get to heaven and I don't know when it's going to happen or when it's going to happen for you. But at that day, it will not just be a, it's not just a positional change. There is a, a perfected change. We'll be perfect in heaven. Boy, I look forward to that. But until we get to that stage of perfection, there is this positional change. There's the perfected change. But in that journey to glory, the journey to heaven, there is to be a progressive change. The Bible is, gives us the word sanctification. It's the idea of being set apart unto the Lord. It is to be ongoing. And I'm asking you, friends, those who know you best, can they sense a progressive spiritual development going on in your life? Do you even notice it? Do you know in your heart that you're progressing? You say, well, what does it look like? Good, good question to ask. And here's what Paul said. He said in verse 10, he said, I have a new priority. What is it that I may know him? This is my new priority. I, I, I have a desire to know Jesus as I've never known anybody. You know, every husband will say that when he got married, he thought he knew his wife. He thought he knew her because they dated for whatever length of time they were dating. And then they got married. And after several years of marriage, he's saying, man, I'm, I'm just beginning to get to know my wife. There is so much more to learn. Why? And because of the compl complexity of each individual, male and female. The point is this. To get to know the Lord is, not a, is, is, a, is only established by accepting Him as Savior. Friends, there is a progress of getting to know Him. You know when Paul wrote these words in Philippi, you know how long he had been a convert to the Christ? 30 years. For 30 years, he said, here's my goal. Here's my pursuit that I may know him. He wasn't interested in just knowing about him. He wasn't just interested in singing songs about him. He wasn't interested in just uh, 
of arguing and debating with other people about the existence of Jesus as the Son of God. It wasn't enough to him just to think hmm, about God. He wanted to know Him. He wanted to pursue Him. He had a new priority to know God. What does that mean? Well, from a practical realm, it means that you and I are going to have to schedule time to listen to Him. That's what you're doing this morning. But you need private time alone with Him and say, Oh God, I want to know you. I really want to know you. I don't know where it is that you're reading in the scriptures. But are you? Are you doing it on a daily basis? What kind of a husband would I be if I never spent time with my wonderful wife? If I didn't take time to talk to her and let her talk to me? I wouldn't be a very loving husband. And what kind of a believer would I really be if I didn't spend time with my Savior and let him talk to me, how are you doing in that area? When David, the king of Israel, was stepping down from the throne of Israel and he was, he was handing off the baton, if you please, of leadership to his son Solomon, he said, my son Solomon, he said in 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 9, know thou the God of your father. For if you seek him, he will be found of thee. What was he saying? He was saying, Solomon, have a, have a new priority in your life to know God. Paul said, not only do I have a new priority, he said, I have a new power. Look at verse 10. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Can I ask you something? In a day of atomic energy, is there anything more powerful than resurrection from the dead? Something that was dead is brought back to life. I'm just, I'm just asking you, is there anything more powerful than that? Here's what, the, here's what this testimony from this man Paul was. He said, I want to know the power of his resurrection in my life. You say, I, I'm not following you, Morris. Do you want power in your prayer life? Do you want power over temptation? Do you want power in your witness and testimony to other people? Do you want the kind of power that is demonstrated by a person who is so intimately close to their God that God is all over you? You see, friends, there is to be a progress of spiritual change. And Paul said here, he said, this is my testimony. He said, I have a new priority. I have a new power. And thirdly, he said, I have, I also have a new partnership. Look again, if you would, at verse 10. He said that I may know him and the power of his, his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Uh, I loved sports. I love sports to this day. I enjoyed playing it as a kid. There was something special about playing in a game and winning or losing Whenever you were hurting and whenever, whenever uh, there was uh, blood coming from a busted elbow or, or a bone that was hurt or something, there was something remarkable about partnership with your teammates. You ask anybody who is retiring from professional sports, what do you miss the most? And they say immediately, almost to a person, they always say, I miss my teammates. I miss that partnership, that locker room experience. Okay, okay, okay. When you are progressing in your walk with the Lord, there's a partnership even in suffering. Are you going to suffer as a follower of the Lord? Sure. People are not going to understand the direction and the decisions that you're making in life. But I'm going to tell you, there's no doubt about it. There is a connection with the Almighty God that is phenomenal. It is incredible. And you know that he is there. And you two are together. <laughs> and there is a new partnership. And Paul said, I want to know that kind of power of his resurrection and the partnership of his sweet fellowship with me. And not only that, he said, finally, I have a new pursuit. A new pursuit, a goal in life. What was that? He said in verse uh, 
uh, going back to our text, he says in verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I do follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. Paul's focus, his eyesight was on the end of the journey. He was saying, when I get to heaven, I, he goes, I'm going to tell you, he goes, I've got a whole brand new pursuit that when I get to glory, when I get to heaven and I see my Savior, I, I, want, to, I want to have lived in such a way that my life will reflect his presence in me and I want him to be pleased. He goes, look, he goes, I've not reached where I need to reach. I have not fulfilled everything I need to fulfill you as of yet. But he said, I've kept my focus on him because I want him to be pleased with me. We, we're so wrapped up in trying to please everybody on earth. We're trying to please ourselves first and foremost with the life that we live. We try to, we try to get the applause and the pleasures of other people. We want other people to like us. I get it. Paul said, brethren, I've got one thought in mind. He says, forgetting what's behind me, both victories and you know, the successes and the failures of my past, he says, I'm going to keep my focus on the future because I've got a new pursuit. You know, when a testimony is what it's supposed to be, that's your focus. You have a new pursuit in life. What's that? I'm going to see God one day, and I want him to be pleased with the life I've lived. I want to hear him say, well done, Morris. Well done. Years ago, I was putting my boy, getting him ready to go to bed. My wife and I were doing so. We were encouraging him to go into his room, to get his room cleaned up, put up the toys, hang up clothes, throw shoes in, in their closet, and whatever, whatever he was supposed to do. And so we were encouraging him to take care of his room so he could get ready and ready for bed. Most children don't like to go to bed at night, and my son was a night owl. He did not want to go to bed, no doubt about it. So he was dragging his feet. I finally looked at him very strongly. And I said, in no uncertain terms, I said, son, this room is to be cleaned up and I'm not playing with you anymore. Get it cleaned right now. He saw the, the determined look in my eye that this was not going to go any further. And he began to put things away and he worked rapidly. I mean, he, he worked hard and I, I was glad that he did. After, after a length of time, whatever length of time it took, he came and found me and he said, daddy, daddy, come here. Come here. We walked down the hall and we walked into his room. And he looked at his room and he, he kind of waved his hand around. He said, Daddy, look. And then with all sincerity, he said to me, does that make you proud of me? And I was, I was mixed with emotions. On the first hand, I thought, have I made him think that I wasn't proud of him? And I don't like that feeling. But more importantly, I want him to know how proud I am of him. I grabbed him, put him up on my shoulders, and we marched down the hall. And I, I made a big to-do about the fact that he had cleaned his room. And I said, I am so proud of you, son. Made a big deal out of it. Put him to bed. We had time in the Word and time in prayer. And after a while, he was asleep. I walked by his room and I saw him there laying in his bed and I thought, I've got to go talk to someone too. I walked over and I got on my knees beside my sleeping boy. I put my hand gently upon his body because I didn't want to awaken him. And I prayed in my heart. I said, dear God, my boy wants me to be proud of him. And I am. And I want you my heavenly father, to be proud of me too. Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. That was several years ago. 
I, I'll be honest with you. It's still the pursuit of my life. Is it yours? Every testimony has three parts. Before Christ, when you come to Christ, and the progress after you come to Christ. In a moment, your pastor will no doubt lead you in a season of prayer. Can I just encourage you, maybe even right now, I'm going to close in prayer, but can I encourage you in the next moment to investigate, research your own heart, ask yourself, do I have this same kind of a testimony? Pastor Bickle would love to be a help to you, especially if you live there in that area. Oh, please let the friends and the leadership of Bethel Baptist Fellowship be a help to you. Would you bow your heads with me, please, for prayer? Heavenly Father, we ask you right now to help us to live in such a way that honors you. May our life be a life of pursuing you, to know you, and to have that partnership with you, even when things are not comfortable in our life. God, help us to understand the power of Almighty God flowing through us, working in our lives. And then, Lord, I pray that the pursuit of our life will be to please you every step of our every day. Encourage your people. Lord, if there was someone here today who needed to accept you as Savior and they've not done so yet, would you please win them unto yourself? I pray that you'll strengthen this local church in such a mighty way during these days together. We ask it in your wonderful name. Amen. Thank you, friend. God bless you.